Uh, I would like to talk about, um, I forget what the word that you've been using again. It's funny how I had my question so clear. It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> Just give us the general concept. Selfishness again. I'd like to talk about selfishness and bring in a couple words. One it's that so you're important just... you can't even remember the word. <laughs> We're just teasing. But a lot of people have a conflict about selfishness. Well, I, I understand and totally appreciate what you have said about it. And then you also said something else, how there are many people that hear your words and all bring a different thing to it, which brings me to this thought that there's a difference oftentimes between what is taught and what is heard. And yes, this because is... you can't hear outside your vibrational stance. In other words, where you are, where, where you are sort of defines what you hear. Okay. So when, when some people hear this selfishness piece, they may not bring integrity to that with regards to, uh, I, I need to bring something out from another uh, seminar that you did the um, master class the Alaska cruise I had listened to those between the last cruise I was on and this one and there was a gentleman there who had um, some financial issues and he made the comment that uh, you know he was getting all these um, creditors calling and bills coming in the mail and he he said oh I, I don't open those and you kind of just let that ride. And I wanted to scream. Um, and what I wanted to scream was, you know, you can't use the law of attraction and your being in the vortex as an excuse for being irresponsible and not making your commitments. And so this is just kind of a... a it's, it's not an issue I have with your teaching. It's more how it gets distorted and people can, can misuse it. I guess it happens in any religion, right? They, they use, and not that this is a religion, but people will use a teaching as justification for their own selfish behavior. Is this making any sense? We think you have presented it in a very clear way. And, and we're happy to address it. It's a, a perfect analogy for what you're reaching for. Okay. So when anyone is approaching, let's back up and take the, the general look at this first. So of course, a, a moral, um, approach as humans would be to keep your commitments and if you sign a contract for something then you should do your best to do it Jerry and Esther have this conversation almost every day as they notice immoral behavior from their point of view things such as uh, being in traffic and having someone in the exit lane moving very fast and then just using the exit lane to get ahead of everyone and then at the last minute pulling in knowing full well that they are not going to exit but being then part of the reason that everything gets backed up Jerry and Esther have talked about that they thought it was they think it is a, a very interesting thing and and over time as we have visited with them about that and other things they have come to realize that from the law of attraction point of view there is not a, a right and wrong or a morality or an immorality there's just an attraction from where you are so let's say a person is unable to pay their bills and and, and they hear about law of attraction and they hear about the vortex and they realize that worrying about the bills makes them uh, feel uncomfortable. And so they take these teachings and they feel better in assigning the meaning to mean that it's better not to think about something that is upsetting to you. And so they, it's like they give up all effort and they don't try to keep their commitment. Now, as Jerry and Esther are standing outside the vortex, especially if those people owed them money, for example, if Jerry and Esther were standing outside the vortex, they would feel uncomfortable with that. And they would try to, try to define, 
in the, in the midst of a conversation like this, Esther awakened in the middle of the night. It was about two o'clock in the morning and they were at their home in Del Mar and she went to the television. She felt such an impulse to turn it on. And there was an interviewer interviewing a man who has written a book. And the book was a fictional book, but this is a man who is a researcher for the New York times. And so he is, he has used lots of studies and was using lots of names in order to back up the premises that he was presenting here. And he said about on this very topic about immorality or morality, what's right and what's wrong. He said, there are many diplomats that come to Washington DC. They come from all over the world. And many of them get parking tickets because they feel entitled to live differently than the rest of the people. And so the parking tickets are rampant and in a certain quadrant of the world, we won't speak what it is. He named several countries. Not only do they get more parking tickets, but they don't never pay them where there are other countries like Canada and Sweden and Switzerland, where not only do they not get many parking tickets, but if they ever do, they pay them. And his, <laughs> that went very, very wrong. His hit, the point that he was making is that the culture is what helps them to define the rightness or the wrongness of things. And then when you bring people together and, and you begin to define the rules, what's right and what's wrong, it makes for compromise and it makes for a lot of consternation because, because there are people who for a very long time have been fostering beliefs that are different from the other people that they may be interacting with them. So what we have noticed as we have been interacting with people from all around the planet is that your beliefs are enormously varied and that whenever you try to socialize yourself into agreement on so many of these beliefs, because it is not possible because you have so many different vantage points, then your world and your world's interaction turns into a constant battle of will and a constant battle of what's right and wrong, a constant clashing of beliefs that is utterly unnecessary. Because we understand the powerful law of attraction and we know that anyone who comes into alignment with what's in their vortex will find themselves as a cooperative component to all kinds of things that are orchestrated. So, so our message, and, and sometimes it's a little hard to hear, you really have to be in the vortex to even get a, a glimpse of what we're talking about is that because there are so many different intentions, some of which blend with yours and some of which don't, if you were to hold everyone specifically to your standards, there's not a person on the planet that you could co-create with because you vary that much, you see. So then as humans, you just decide that you will just be, find the common denominator on the big things, but you can't even successfully do that. So when we're visiting with any individual, we know that this particular person even will never find alignment with who he is inside the vortex by not keeping his responsibilities as he has defined them. We know that that behavior will not lead to his happiness, but we also understand and understood then in that conversation that if we were to try to guide him to a behavior that was different than he was able to find in that moment, that we would be coaching him from outside the vortex and it would get worse, not better. You see. Nothing gets better until you get into the vortex and you can't demand someone in. You can't condemn someone into the vortex. You can't blame someone into the vortex. You can't embarrass someone into the vortex. You can't humiliate somebody into the vortex. You, you can't socialize someone into the vortex, you see. So we never, ever, ever, ever try. Even when we know that that person will never be happy until he does fulfill his responsibility to others. Still, we did not go there because had we gone there, he would have struck a more defiant stance. He would have defended where he is in a stronger way. And we would have, he would have lost ground with his vortex, even though we weren't talking about the vortex in those days, rather than gain ground. And we are always calling people forward into the vortex, you see.
So what we were basically saying to him is whatever you can do that gives you some ease is a step in the right direction. And sometimes beating yourself over the head with a club really is not a step in the right direction. So when you stop it, you'll find some ease. And we know that he'll find the path to fulfilling what he is wanting. No one feels good in not keeping a commitment that they have established, but commitments do evolve. They do change. They are refined. You see, is that helpful? Uh, yeah. And, and I, when you were saying there's nothing we can all agree on, I, I can certainly understand that. Uh, would it be safe to say that the golden rule is as close as we get? You know, what is it? Uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So that, in other words, if... Well, but, but, but that golden rule is based on a flawed premise. Because what it says is, I do unto you as I would like you to do unto me. But that's understanding that you're in the vortex with me where you will do things that are vortex-like. In other words, to ask someone to do what... If you're in the vortex and they're not, to ask them to do what you would do is asking an impossible thing. Because they're not... They are not... They are not... They have not trained themselves selfishly enough to be in alignment with the love and the well-being they don't have that to flow you see mm -hmm. and of course you could you, you you could extend it and say well abram what i meant was it is my desire that they all find their way into alignment with who they are so that they can then benevolently give to me as i would give to them but but it, what it is it's putting other people into the equation that don't need to be there the true golden rule is I am the creator of my own experience and when I come into alignment with the fullness and the goodness and the value and the worthiness of that which I am only things like that can come to me that's the golden law you see that was good it's just not quite as short and catchy <laughs> I, I do unto others as I would have others do unto me. You like that short and catchy phrase. So, so we would say, I do unto others from my perspective of alignment, knowing that if I consistently do it, they too will follow my path. That's better. A bit too long. Let's shorten it up. Yeah, we don't have long memories down here on this planet. So, pithy so good is, enough. Pithy is good. good. Very good. Thank you. Shortest version, golden rule. I choose to love. Now what? <laughs>